Formula E didn't have to look this way. In fact, it could have looked quite radically different. After ejecting multiple manufacturers at the very start of the championship, Formula E subsequently planned to open up the grid to different chassis makers in its fifth season, and that resulted in at least three really wild concepts being submitted. These are the lost cars of Formula E. Subscribers to this channel may have noticed that we've already done a Lost Cars of Formula E video, covering the wild designs proposed for the championship's inaugural season, but this video is about the designs proposed for the fifth season of Formula E and the controversy which resulted. Formula E had been using a car developed jointly by Delara and Fred Vasseur's Spark Racing Technology Organisation, yes, that Fred Vasseur, for the first four seasons of the championship's history. But for the fifth season, the series wanted a new, faster and longer range design. In 2016, the FIA announced that the original plan to allow proper chassis competition from Season 5 had been abandoned, much like a similar plan was abandoned for Season 1 and then again in Season 2. Indeed, after this announcement, Alejandro Agag made it really clear that chassis competition was not welcome in Formula E. He said, We don't want to open up the chassis side ever. This is not a chassis championship. It's not about aero. It's not a stance I particularly agree with, but let's move on from that. Once it was decided that the new car would be a one-make design, the FIA issued an invitation to tender document. It meant different chassis makers could make proposals and the best one would be selected. The tender, though, included some really clear stipulations, and there's a few more we'll get to as we go on. Applicants for the tender must lodge a three- and four-year supply pit. At least one bodywork concept in each pitch must be futuristic. The cars must be about 40 kilograms lighter than the then-current cars were, and they couldn't cost more than 270,000 euros for the car kit, which didn't actually include the batteries, inverters or motors. A second and separate tender was issued to battery suppliers, as the second generation cars, like the first generation cars, would retain one make batteries. And it meant that the battery supplier and the car supplier would not necessarily be able to work together until both had been awarded the tender. You can see the specifications required for that battery tender on the screen right now. The tender was ultimately won by McLaren. In terms of the chassis, there were at least three solid proposals, and we will look at each of them in turn. Now, I do believe that there were probably more proposals than that, but I've never seen any evidence of them. So if you do know anything about those other proposals, then do please let me know in the comments. To be clear though, I'm not going to include the Mahindra Pininfarina concept sketches. They were not a serious proposal. One additional request from the promoters was that those who were responding to the tender should take inspiration from the fairly wild concepts for future F1 cars which have been produced by Red Bull, McLaren and even Ferrari. And you'll notice some of the bids directly lifted concepts from some of these designs. The first proposal to cover is from Dome, the hugely experienced Japanese car constructor. If you're not familiar with Dome, make sure you subscribe to this channel because you soon will be. It had everything needed to pitch for the Formula E tender. Futuristic design was not unfamiliar to the engineers at Dome, but they wanted to make the proposal the best it could be. So they teamed up with Ken Okuyama, who'd been the creative director of Pininfarina, working on multiple Ferrari concepts, amongst other things. After leaving Pininfarina, setting up his own agency, he went on to create a few cars under his own name, like the Code 57. Styling was not everything when it came to responding to the tenders. All of the cars proposed had to meet drag coefficient targets set at 0.65, much lower than the Spark 01e, which had a figure of 0.75. The striking proposal from Dome you see here was aimed at a car with a minimum weight of 888 kilograms with a weight distribution of 38% on the front axle. In terms of the monocoque, it would be constructed to 2015 FIA F1 safety standards and feature a nose somewhat lower than the Spark 01e, while for the same reasons, the cockpit sides would have to be fitted with anti-intrusion panels. Mechanically, the design was otherwise fairly conventional, at least at first glance, with double wishbone suspension all around with pushrod actuated springs and dampers. The monocoque design itself was somewhat challenging and Dome looked to its S102 LMP1 car for inspiration. That car had a recess in the rear bulkhead to allow the engine to be mounted further forwards in the car than would have otherwise been possible and the same approach would be taken with the Formula E car and its battery pack. The bodywork of the car though was quite unconventional with the twin element front wing blended into the wheel pods over the fully enclosed front wheels. In fact they even seemed to be the potential to fit headlights
lights to the car. An extra wing element linked the wheel pod to the main bodywork behind the front suspension. The cockpit featured a version of the proposed and tested Red Bull aero screen rather than a halo. The side pods were conventional, if rather curvaceous. The engine cover was also quite conventional, but featured a huge dorsal fin. Like the front wheels, the rear wheels were also fully enclosed and housed in remote pods. These linked directly to a very low twin element rear wing with a V-shape dipping towards the centre of the car. This was not a pure styling exercise. The chassis was fully designed by Dome, and these early sketches show the basic car layout, but note that the battery is not recessed into the rear bulkhead in these early designs. The concept also featured some really interesting design elements, such as lasers firing out of the car's nose. Though this wasn't some sort of semi-violent space age overtaking aid, but instead it was to display the car's position on the track ahead of it. At the rear, the car would have had lights indicating its fan boost status as well as on the dorsal fin, while a gauge on the top of the car's roll hoop would show the car's charge status to fans at the racetrack or even watching on television. Another quite wild idea was for each car to essentially have a loyal wingman style drone chasing it around the track and giving unique camera angles and possibly carrying screens for sponsor activation. Another option was for the car's charge status to be displayed through a glowing membrane on the skin of the car's bodywork. That one I'd have really liked to see. Ultimately though, none of these ideas were ever considered by the FIA or Formula E, and nor indeed was the Dome and Ken Okuyama design at all. After Dome had indicated its intention to bid for the tender, apparently the terms of the deal were changed by the FIA. Now I can't find any confirmation of what changed or why it changed, but Dome was so unhappy with this situation that it completely withdrew its bid. There were rumours at the time that the FIA, or perhaps Formula E, wanted to work exclusively with its own preferred designer. That was rumoured to be Daniel Simon of the Cosmic Racers fame. He'd also designed the Robo car for the related Robo race series, and that's a, something we're going to have to come back to. The suggestion ultimately was that the company's tendering would have to build a car to the preferred designer's concepts and not to their own ideas. And to Dome, it was completely unacceptable to do this, as they seemed to feel that it would mean they lost control of the design and indeed the performance of the car. And apparently, other bidders also withdrew at this point, though I don't know who they were and how much of that is correct. And this next pitch does need a little bit more introduction. It came from a French organisation called TEOS, T-E-O-S, a name unfamiliar to most outside of the very deep levels of the motorsport engineering industry, but its parent company, Mechachrome, may be a bit more familiar. Mechachrome has long been a key part of the Renault power unit manufacturing process and has played a key role in all recent Renault branded Formula 1 engines and power units. TEOS also played a key role in developing those engines as well as the ones used in the current Formula 2 and Formula 3 cars and engines that have been raced at the Le Mans 24 hours. As a powertrain supplier it was really a bit surprising to see it bidding for a chassis supply contract but TEOS had partnered with Ades AG, a race car constructor based in Munich, Germany. Ades had developed the Dallara F110 Grand Prix chassis all the way into the HRT F112 chassis used by the same team in 2012. It had also designed its own Le Mans prototypes, initially branded as the Lotus T128, and we'll absolutely have to get back to that one, as well as the cars it made for the LMP3 category, and it also supplied the chassis to the Nissan Zeod, and you know we're going to get back to that one. So it's clear that the Tios and Ades bid also had everything needed to supply the Formula E championship. The Tios Formula E concept car was not all that different in its overall concept to the Dome proposal, at least at first glance, though it was a lot less curvaceous. Like the Dome car, it had double wishbone suspension all around and fully enclosed wheels housed in remote pods front and rear. The nose was wider and flatter than that seen on the Dome and also slightly higher. It also featured a front wing linked to the remote front wheel pods like the Dome, but the concept was actually quite different. In fact, the front wing had a really quite interesting design with a sculpted main plane with upper flaps as well as a single thinner element mounted much higher up. The side pod design is extremely interesting. The cooling ducts look to be quite small and they're surrounded by a remote outer ring of bodywork. This probably was mostly there as a styling part but it also probably housed the side impact structures. The floor of the car would have been much wider than that of the dome and I think that was quite a conscious choice. The car features quite an interesting 
rear wing, and I think it was inspired by the Red Bull X1 and X2010 project. It was linked to the rear wheel pods above, but not attached to the rear impact structure. While the proposal was just that, an outline of what a Teos car would be, the Teos engineers also admitted that they would probably need to make some revisions to the battery placement of the car, and that the whole car would have to undergo significant CFD work. For me, looking at the top angle of the car, it looks really narrow, really compact, and I struggle slightly to see how they were going to package all of the electrical gubbins into the back of that design. The cockpit is very interesting, with what at first glance seems to be a Red Bull aero screen, the exact same thing that IndyCar uses today and exactly what Dome were proposing to use, but it looks to be a bit more elongated and I think perhaps closer in concept to the so-called Shield aero screen tested by Ferrari in 2017. That screen though notably was reported to have caused visual distortion for the driver when it was tested. Of course, at this point, when this car was being proposed, nobody had tried it on a real car, so any issues with it were purely theoretical. As history shows, the Teos concept was not selected, and I'm not sure if Teos, like Dome, withdrew its bid. Either way, it wasn't chosen. The last bidder was, of course, Spark, and its proposal was really quite wild. Spark, if you remember, had supplied the original Formula E car. Well, if you don't count the original Formula E F01 that became the first car in Formula E, there's a whole other video for that. Click the link. Spark's proposal as I say, was really quite wild, but not many pictures were ever released of that proposal. But what you saw in the pictures was very different to the eventual Spark SRT 05E, which went on to become the main car for Formula E from season five to season eight. In fact, the proposal looked more like a spaceship than a racing car. It had a low nose, double wishbone suspension front and rear with push rods, though I've no idea on the internal layout of that suspension because I suspect nobody at Spark did either because this car was so far out there. The front wheels were shrouded in wheel pods like the other competitors were and they were linked to the main chassis of the car with a bodywork section quite high up and a single plane but rather wiggly front wing. The rear wheel pods though were fully integrated with the rear bodywork and that sets this car aside from the other proposals. Curiously on the renderings issued, on, there were only four renderings issued actually, but on three of those four renderings the cockpit was fully enclosed, but on the fourth rendering it was not, and we'll get back to that fourth rendering in a moment. The closed cockpit of the car was just not a realistic solution, for many reasons that we'll probably cover in a future video, but it would have had to have opened forwards or sideways, but no hinges could be seen in the renders, but it was also entirely unrealistic in other ways. The rear view mirrors, for example, which on closer inspection of the renderings looked rather badly photoshopped in, well they'd be pretty much useless to the driver due to the sculpting and the shape of the curvature of that cockpit canopy. I do though like how the rear brake ducts are integrated with the wheel arch. In reality three of the four pictures issued by Spark are nothing more than pure fantasy but the fourth picture they issue showed a really viable concept. It was an open cockpit car for starters and it used a Red Bull aero screen. There was no rear wing visible in the render and the bodywork seems to be a bit less curvy than in the spaceship concept as I call it. But it's a bit hard to see that from the only angle of available square side on. Note though the exposed lower side impact structure, that really harks back to the first generation of Formula E car. In reality this sketch was the only one from Spark that had any real relevance to the final car, the Spark 05e. That car in itself has a really interesting story which I don't think is quite over actually, but that's a topic for, or topics that we'll have to get back to as well. Now as I've said I do believe that there were other bidders in the process but they've never been disclosed. However there were were suggestions at the time that some of those bids simply repurposed Formula 3 chassis designs. This is actually a really odd suggestion as at the time there was only one Formula 3 manufacturer other than Dallara active in the sport and that was the Russian Art Tech team with their P315 concept and that's an interesting project we'll also have to come back to but that car just wouldn't have met the FIA requirements to meet the 2015 FIA safety regulations so I think that talk of the Formula 3 chassis was just paddock rumour without any substance. Do you know who the other bidders were? If you do, please do let me know in the comments. I'm desperate to find out, quite frankly. What was your favourite concept as well from these three, or even the Season 1 Lost Cars as well? Again, let me know that in the comments too. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed this futuristic, electron fueled look back at what might have been in the world of Formula E. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon, somewhere in the pit lane. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe.